Now, the the whole idea of the case in Edwards and Stillman, both those cases were cases where the police had not gotten warrants. We've already talked a little bit about warrants, but it's important to explain exactly what a warrant is. Essentially, a warrant is a permission slip from the judge for the police to go ahead and conduct a search. What happens is, the way it works, the police go to a judge. There's a judge waiting in the Palais de Justice in the basement in Montreal. Or you just, If you're a police officer, you call in to the police officer whose job it is to go talk to the judge. You tell him all the reasons you have, all the evidence you have so far to justify why it's okay to go ahead with the search. That guy explains it to the judge. The judge listens. He listens to the details about why it is you think there's something there details about exactly where you're planning to search and what it is you're hoping to find. And then if it's all good, the judge okays the search. And if they do this, then the search will usually be considered reasonable and the evidence when it goes to court will count. There's a presumption that if the police went through these steps, that whatever whatever it is they do has already been okayed ahead of time by the judge and it's going to be admissible as evidence in court. Uh, however, in a warrantless search, uh, again, that's uh, most of the cases that go to court over Section 8 are warrantless ones. They didn't get permission from the judge in the first place uh, because the, either they didn't think it was worth it or we'll talk about there may be reasons why they thought it was justifiable to not get uh, a warrant ahead of time. But in these cases, it's presumed ahead of time. It's presumed the police are already at a disadvantage in the court case. It's presumed to be unreasonable. That means that when they go to court, it's up to the police to convince the judge that the evidence can be used. It's not like the evidence speaks for itself. You have to bring it into court, and before the judge will let it into the courtroom, you have to convince him that, yes, we didn't get a warrant in this case, but it's still reasonable for us to have conducted the search. So uh, when they're doing this, where they're trying to convince the judge that it was reasonable for us to conduct the search, they can't just say, look, judge, the, the way we know it was a good idea for us to conduct this search is that we ended up finding the gun in the guy's pocket. That's how we knew it was a good idea. No, you found that out after. You can't use that as your justification for how you knew ahead of time that it was okay to do the search. You might see how this is important, right? If the whole idea of Section 8 is to protect regular people from the police just conducting random searches, then a random search that finds something can't be justifiable. You can't wait until after the fact to justify doing the search uh, in the first place. You, what the police need to have is before the search is conducted, and this is, in, again, another important in bold and underlined point here, ahead of time the police need reasonable grounds to believe that they would find something, and they also need a justification for why they didn't get a warrant to justify not getting the warrant. So I had reasonable grounds to believe that I was going to find something. It's not just that I was hoping I would find something. It's not just that I had a hunch. It's that I had reasons that I could really explain to you that made it clear that I was going to find something. Uh, the information that they can use to justify how they knew they would find something, it can come from tips that they got. It can even be anonymous tips as long as they're sufficiently credible. It can come from hearsay like this guy told me that I he heard from another guy that you'd find a gun in that guy's backyard or whatever it is. But whatever it is, it has to be something that they're able to explain. The, the legal word is articulable. It has to be something they're able to explain to somebody else, specifically a judge, why they actually believe they would find it. It can't be, look, I had a good feeling about this. I just knew I was going to find something nasty. I had a hunch. None of that is good enough. You have to be able to explain it. Now, the justifications for why they can rush ahead and get uh, and do a search without taking the time to get a warrant from a judge uh, keep in mind that to get a warrant from a judge, you can often do that over the phone. You call your guy at the courthouse, he talks to the judge, the judge okays it and like can fax or send you a telewarrant over the phone to your police car. So really they can make this happen pretty quickly. So if, if you're trying to say, look, I just couldn't wait for a warrant, you really have to have a good reason for that. That can be something like it happened during an arrest. Uh, there was a, an element of time, an element of danger, an element in which the evidence might have been lost if I didn't move quickly enough. Often it'll be in the context of roadside stops where there's safety issues. If you've got a car by the side of the road, every minute it's by the side of the road increases the possibility that there could be potentially an accident with a car especially at night, not seeing that there's a police car and another car by the side of the road. So you need to establish why it was impractical to wait in order to justify a warrantless search. Now let's look at a, a, another case of a warrantless search that uh, involves the police going ahead without a warrant and finding something. What happened was uh, this was a, a young person targeted. That's why you don't have their name here. You just have an abbreviation. That's the way these cases are reported. And this is a case from 2008 where there was a school principal 
who had told the local police officers, look, uh, you know, we, we really value uh, safety. We want to protect our students here. We want to protect against a dangerous element. So anytime you happen to have your sniffer dog with you, anytime you can come by, please uh, just come on by and do a locker search. We'll be happy to comply. Uh, and so the police did happen to drop by with a sniffer dog. And you might not understand this, but canine units, sniffer dogs, are really not as common as you'd expect. They're quite valuable commodities and, and not, as, uh, not as common as you would hope if you were a police officer to be able to rely on a sniffer dog. So they happen to have a sniffer dog available. They're like, great, let's go by the school. They go by the principal's like, oh, fantastic. This will be really good to help all the kids understand we're serious here, we mean business. Uh, but the police in this case had no information, neither from the principal nor anybody else, that there were specifically any drugs around in the school. It was just like, well, let's just do the, the this, you know, we'll have the dog go around. If we see something, we see something. So they had all the kids line up their bags in the gym on the wall, and they had the dog walk by. And the way that dogs, sniffer dogs work is if they smell something illegal, they're trained for specific things, like you have drug dogs, you have bomb dogs, you have different kinds of dogs. Uh, if they did find drugs to indicate, so sit up, that they'd found something. And that's exactly what happened here. The dog was sniffing the lockers and then sniffing the bags in the gym. And next to one bag, the dog sits up so the police know there's something in that bag. And they did indeed find the drugs. So then the question became, okay, uh, once the dog sits up, now we have really good information to know that this specific bag has got drugs in it. We're ready to open it up. Uh, before that happens... Uh, it, do you have an expectation of privacy? Like once the, once the police see the dog going, oh, yeah, or there's something here, now your expectation of privacy might be lowered because the police have really good reason um, to look through your bag. Um, but until that happens, is it okay for the dog to sniff your bag? And now it's only okay for the dog to sniff your bag if doing so isn't a search because before the dog sniffs your bag, right, there's no information that there's anything wrong going on. Uh, so what the Supreme Court had to decide was, does this sniffing count as searching? And ultimately what they decided is yes. And the reason why is they said the technology, the biotechnology of a dog's nose is so incredibly advanced that when the dog sniffs your bag, it's like the dog is already looking in your bag because they can see through their noses. They can see uh, so, they have such a refined sense of smell. Uh, and since at the time that the dog sniffs your bag, there was no suspicion, uh, no thing to indicate that you were guilty of anything, that search, which was the sniffing, was unreasonable because it was completely at random. And in that case, the evidence was excluded.